Okay, hello everyone, Clark Towson here. I'm the CEO of INTJ Billing. And in this video today, we're going to watch a TED Talk, a um, very interesting TED Talk. And then I'm going to uh, talk through a few key points after, after we've viewed it. So let's view it now and um, then I'll talk through it. Well, we all know the World Wide Web has absolutely transformed publishing, broadcasting, commerce, and social connectivity. But where did it all come from? And I'll quote three people, uh, Vannevar Bush, Doug Engelbart, and Tim Berners-Lee. So let's just run through these guys. This is Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush was the US government's chief scientific advisor during the war. And in 1945, he published an article in a magazine called Atlantic Monthly. And the article was called, As We May Think. And what Vannevar Bush was saying was, the way we use information is broken. We, uh, we don't work in terms of libraries and catalog systems and so forth. The brain works by association. With one item in its thought, it snaps instantly to the next item. And the way information is structured is totally incapable of keeping up with this process. And so he suggested a machine, and he called it the Memex. And the Memex would link information one piece of information to a related piece of information and so forth. Now, this was in 1945. A computer in those days was something that secret um, services used to use for code breaking. And it was absolutely, you know, nobody knew anything about it. So this was before the computer was invented. And he proposed this machine called the Memex. And he had a platform where you linked information to other information. And then you could call it up at will. So spinning forward, one of the guys who read this article was a guy called Doug Engelbart. And he was a US Air Force officer. And he was reading it in a library in the Far East. And he was so inspired by this article that it kind of directed the rest of his life. And by the mid-60s, he was able to put this into action when he worked at the Stanford Research Lab in California. He built a system. The system was designed to augment human intelligence, it was called. And in a premonition of today's world of cloud computing and software as a service, the system was called NLS for Online System. And this is uh, Doug Engelbart. He was giving a presentation at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in 1968. What he showed, he sat on a stage like this, and he demonstrated this system. He had his head mic like I've got. And he works this system. And you can see he's, he's working between documents and graphics and so forth. And he's driving it all with this, uh, this platform here with a, a five-finger keyboard and the world's first computer mouse which he specially designed in order to do this system. So this is where the mouse came from as well. So this was Doug Engelbart. The trouble with Doug Engelbart's system was the, the computers in those days cost several million pounds. So for a personal computer, you know, a few million pounds was like having a personal jet plane. It wasn't really very practical. But spin on to the 80s, when personal computers did arrive, then there was room for this kind of system on personal computers. And my company, OWL, built a system called Guide for the Apple Macintosh. And we uh, delivered the world's first hypertext system. And this began to get ahead of steam. Apple introduced a thing called HyperCard. Uh, they made a bit of fuss about it. They had a 12-page supplement in the Wall Street Journal the day it launched. The magazine started to cover it. Byte magazine and the, the communications of the ACM had special issues covering hypertext. And we developed a PC version of this product as well as the Macintosh version. And our PC version became quite mature. Um, these are some examples of the system in action in the late 80s. We were able to deliver documents. We were able to do it over networks. Uh, we developed a system such that it had a markup language um, based on HTML. We called it HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. Um, and the system was capable of doing very, very large documentation systems over computer networks. So I took this system to a trade show in Versailles near Paris in late November 1990. And I was approached by a nice young man called Tim Berners-Lee, who said, are you Ian Ritchie? I said, yeah. And he said, I need to talk to you. And he told me about his proposed system called the World Wide Web. And I thought, well, that's kind of a pretentious name, especially if a whole system ran on his computer in his office. <laughs> but he was completely convinced that his World Wide Web would take over the world one day. And uh, he tried to persuade me to write the browser for it, because his system didn't have any graphics or fonts or layout or anything. It was just, just plain uh, text. And uh, I thought, well, you know, interesting. But the guy from CERN, he's not going to do this. So we, uh, we didn't do it. In the next uh, couple of years, the hypertext community didn't recognize him either. In 1992, his paper was rejected for the hypertext conference. 
1993, <laughs> there was a table at the conference in Seattle, and a guy called Mark Andreessen was demonstrating his uh, little browser for the World Wide Web, and I saw it and I thought, yep, that's it. And the very next year, in 1994, we had the conference here in Edinburgh, and I had no opposition in having Tim Berners-Lee as the keynote speaker. So that puts me in pretty illustrious company. There's a guy called Dick Rowe, who uh, was at Decca Records and turned down the Beatles. There was a guy called Gary Kildall, who went flying his plane when uh, IBM came looking for an operating system for their IBM PC. And uh, he wasn't there, so they went back to see Bill Gates. And there's the 12 publishers who turned down J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, I guess. On the other hand, there's Mark Andreessen, who wrote the world's first browser for the World Wide Web. And according to Fortune magazine, he's worth $700 million. But is he happy? So, what are the lessons here? Well, number one, be open to new ideas. Number two, take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves. Three, concentrate on where the puck is going, not just where the puck is currently. Four, accept invitations to work with visionaries and pioneering people who, who can see and importantly, who have the skills to shape the future. And that's a key thing right there, the skills to shape the future, okay? In the government, we had criteria uh, for this, for key management positions. Shapes strategic direction. Shapes strategic direction. Hard thing to say all at once, very important. Shaping strategic direction. What does that mean? Well, it means having the knowledge, insight, wisdom, the skills, the experience, um, the care factor, and so on, to present an idea, a concept, and so on, and then work with a group of people on that idea, lead that group of people's thinking on the concept, which will manifest in that group of people engaging in actions collectively, i.e., as a team to go in the strategic direction that uh, you've charted. Now, that TED talk is very interesting as Ian Ritchie and his company, they were already working on hypertext, right? So Ritchie had a company, had a group of people working on that piece of technology, they had a working system that they'd put out there in the world. So Richie and his team were working on something important, but they didn't realize just how important that something uh, is, uh, i.e. hypertext, and how important it would be at scale, right? So they were missing something, missing a key idea, which Sir Tim Berners-Lee brought to the table. So Tim knew full well and was completely convinced that his World Wide Web would take over the world one day. Now, by approaching Ian Ritchie at the conference in November 1990, you know, Tim tried, he tried to shape Ritchie's uh, strategic direction in persuading him to write the browser for the World Wide Web, but he wasn't able to do so. He just couldn't convince him. Tim was quite... I guess, quote unquote, the guy from CERN, right? He's not going to do this. Mm -hmm. So Tim knew that Ian was a man in a position, a position of power and influence who had almost, almost all the ingredients to do something of great importance, right? in this case for the entire world, if only he could convince him. And, you know, Tim kept working on his idea and he wrote a paper which was incredibly rejected for the Hypertext conference a few years later. And then, as he said, in 1993, at, at a conference, Mark Andreessen demonstrated his browser for the World Wide Web, and then Ian Ritchie had his light bulb moment. And there it was, staring at him right in the face. If only he had, a few years before, worked with uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, but he passed up the opportunity. And of course, at that time, 
there was no sir before Tim Berners-Lee's uh, name. He was just Tim Berners-Lee. Now, if you're in a position of power and influence and a visionary approaches you with an idea or a concept, how do you know if you should grasp the opportunity or whether to pass on it? There are signs. For example, where did Tim Berners-Lee work? Right. Where did he work? Well, he worked at CERN. What is CERN? CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. That should have been Ian Ritchie's first clue that he was talking to someone with keen insight. CERN doesn't just employ anyone. Working in a place like CERN, a person benefits a lot from those around them. The scientific research organization is full of bright people, very bright people who upon stepping out of such an organization will be more than capable, more than capable of achieving great things if they should put their minds to it. Another thing, are you talking to an introvert or an extrovert? Certain Myers-Briggs types are systems thinkers. INTJs, for example, I'm an INTJ, scientists, masterminds, and architects. Um, and INTPs, logicians, for example. How will you know you're talking to such a type? Well, you'll know, right? You'll know. They'll come across as an analyst and likely not as an entrepreneur. An introverted analyst type will only step into a leadership role if they see a vacuum. A man like uh, Tim Berners-Lee, for example, is an INTP, the prototypical logician. That's likely one of the reasons why Richie thought, well, he's not going to do this, right? Perhaps judging him on a business level. Richie was in a business level position working on hypertext um, and then he's approached by an analyst, right? An INTP. Perhaps as a business person, he's thinking, well, this guy's not going to do this, right? He's, he's, this guy's not an entrepreneur. He's, a, he's a, an analyst at, at CERN. So on screen now, Myers-Briggs types, right? Analysts, diplomats, sentinels, and explorers, right? As a business leader, when you come across someone who's presenting a concept or an idea, maybe go through, maybe go through this list and ask yourself, all right, who are you dealing with? Who are you talking to? Are they, are they introverted or are they extroverted? Um, what Myers-Briggs type are they? Key insight and key ideas will often come from the INTJ or the INTP, right? Introverted personalities who have got a lot of time uh, to, you know, who like a lot of alone time and do a lot of thinking um, and idea generation uh, in their alone time, right? Are you dealing with uh, an extrovert, someone more extroverted on the business level like an ENTJ? prototypical commander, right? Often you'll get the key insight though from the INTJ and the INTP. On the business level, you'll, you'll get insight from the extroverted uh, types like the ENTJ um, in particular, right? Sometimes ideas will come to you uh, and you'll know that you're talking to a diplomat, right? A feelings type personality, right? You'll know that, that type when they come to you. Uh, sentinels as well, right? You'll know that type very, very quickly. And of course, we've got the explorers. So a keen insight from this graphic, if you think about it, so Tim Berners-Lee being a logician, INTP, stepping into the role of on, uh, entrepreneur, which is more an ESTP thing, right? An extra, extroverted sensing, thinking and perceiving type. You know, you've got to ask yourself the question as a business leader, okay, why is this analyst, why is this analyst who um, is a nerd type, why is this analyst stepping into the role of an entrepreneur? Something must be up here, right? Analysts don't just step over and step into those types of positions unless they see a great need. They see a leadership vacuum or they've got some great idea which can benefit a lot of people and they, they, they have to get out there and, and sell the idea, which you know, the introverted types don't, um, don't like doing. Next, does the person that you're talking to have a background in the subject matter they're talking about? So 
Do they have the knowledge, the skills, the experience to pull off what they're talking about? Is the person flexible? Are they going to stick around? Right? Now, in a tourist town like Pattaya, Thailand, um, that's an important factor, for example. Is what the person talking about, is their idea on the fringe? Is it on the horizon or is it over the horizon? Where is it when it comes to that? If they achieve the thing that they're talking about, will it change something important? So will it usher in a new era or provide benefits which have not been possible before? Will the idea help people? Well, that's the big one right there. Helping people, will it help people? Are you yourself, as, as a person in a position of power and influence, uh, are you capable of evaluating the person yourself? Now you may or you may not be, and that's okay, right? You'll likely know other people who can evaluate the person and you can turn to that person for specialist uh, advice. Have you yourself worked on something similar in the past, but the technology was not at the right stage of development to usher in the change that is being proposed? This is, this is often the case where a business person has uh, worked on something before, has worked in, a, in, in an area, and they've been too early to it, and there's been a whole lot of development that needed to go on in order for um, the the idea, the change that this person is talking about to be implemented. That's, that's very, very common, especially among people who are working in uh, frontier marketplaces like Pattaya, Thailand. This is a frontier marketplace, right? So very, very common. Is the thing at the cutting edge? Is it in a gray area of legality? Could it go one way or the other based on legislation? but is likely to be successful some years from now because the legislation will have to for, for the thing, because the thing is so powerful that the government either gets on board with it or gets left behind. Um, when I say the government, so the government is there to provide uh, for the people essentially, right? So um, when a technology is very powerful, uh, ultimately it's the people that benefit from it, right? And finally, of course, as a business person, you've got to ask, well, what's in it for me, right? If you're a business person, that question is an important one. Will the idea benefit my business? If so, how? Will it bring in extra revenue? How close is it to bringing in extra revenue? Is the concept proposed at a stage of development where there's a working system? Has that system been demonstrated? Does it work, all right? That's one with uh, Elizabeth, if you think about Elizabeth Holmes, uh, you know, she was a, a, a big fraud, right? She, uh, how, <laughs> it amazes me with her case that more people didn't say, all right, show me the system, show me, show me it working. I want to see it actually work in real time, right? That would have been the first thing that I would, would have wanted to, to have seen if I was dealing with someone like, uh, like Holmes. So... I want you to keep this, this, TED, uh, this TED talk firmly in mind, right? Because I think it's a really important, really important uh, talk. Um, very, very interesting. Now, the work that I'm proposing here in Pattaya, Thailand, uh, in Soy 6, right, in the red light area, will usher in a new era for support payments for the working girls. So if you're a bar owner within the Soy, I want you to evaluate me and the system I'm proposing with the extra wisdom and insight that you've gained by watching uh, this TED talk, right? So I'm no Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, of course, but I am a computer scientist just like him. And I do come from a similar scientific research organization, um, very similar to CERN, just like Sir Tim. Um, so there are two key similarities there, computer scientists, very similar organization, scientific research. So if it's not me that is working on this thing over here with you, um, keep in mind that it will be someone at some point in time in the future. And that someone may be yourself as a business person who implements the technology yourself or work, works with um, some, some technical people to implement that technology for your business. So BTC pay and the benefits to your business and, and staff are just too powerful to ignore. 
So I'll leave you with a quote from Sir Tim Berners-Lee that is rather apt given, given what I'm working on, on here. So Tim says, most of the technology involved in the web, like hypertext, like the internet, multi-font text objects, had all been designed already. I just had to put them together. It was a step of generalizing, going to a higher level of abstraction, thinking about all the documentation systems out there as being possibly part of a larger imaginary uh, documentation system. So Tim Berners-Lee. And I guess that's all I'm doing here, right? Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, putting them together in, in a new way, in such a way that uh, can benefit uh, this group of people over here in Pattaya, uh, Thailand. Okay, that's it for me. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. All the best, everyone. I'm Clark Towson, CEO of INTJ Billing.